Hola amigos, today I bring you a shader tutorial that had been requested some time ago by a few viewers. We're going to make this dithering post-process material that you see here step by step. We will also see how different masks affect the result and add a couple of parameters to adjust the colors. I will first show an extremely simple version of the effect, but what makes this one special is that the dithering texture is spherically mapped and rotating with the camera which makes the effect more stable and avoids the swimming effect of a screen map post-process mask. Credit for this technique goes to Lucas Pope, who developed the effect for his game Return of the Obra Dinn. If you haven't seen it, it is a great game and definitely worth checking it out. Obviously in that case he spent lots of time creating the visual style and there is much more to this look than just the dithering but if you want to give a similar retro look to your project, this would be a good place to start. And with the introduction out of the way, we can get started. Today's tutorial will be more in the beginner level, but I still think that the spherical mapping of a post-process texture is a clever trick that has other potential uses, so you might want to stay for that part, even if you already know how to do a one-bit dithering. Here's my test map. I'll start by creating a material and we'll name it Post Process Material Dither. Open it and for now we'll just change the domain to Post Process and output the scene color. We'll make some adjustments in a moment, but until then it will be easier if we can still see the viewport where we work. Remember that for this type of materials you cannot use the scene color directly, but instead select the texture Post Process Input 0 which corresponds to the final color. Let's add it to our render. Back in the main viewport, add a post process volume and change its properties to be unbound, so it doesn't depend on the camera's position. Then, add a material slot with an asset reference and select the post process material that we just made. Before we go back to it though, let me open two sample dither masks that I got to explain how this technique works. One of these is a simple grid pattern with four different grayscale values, while the other is a slightly blurry blue noise. The idea is to convert our image to one bit by using these masks to determine how to remap all the original colors to just black and white. We will do that by first converting the image to grayscale and then comparing each pixel value with a corresponding one in these textures. If the original pixel is brighter, then we will output a 1 and if it's darker than the texture, we'll output a zero. That simple operation is all we need for the basic version of this effect, and we can do that with a few nodes. Let's check it out. Here's the material again. We can start by making some room and adding two samplers for the textures. We'll use both to quickly switch between them and see the difference between order and chaotic patterns. Next, Let's add a desaturation node set to 1. The default luminance factor values in this node, which you can change in the properties panel, are balanced in a way that takes into account color perception, but you can experiment using this setting in conjunction with object material colors to have more control over your final image. Now, since we're dealing only with grayscale values here, we don't need to compare all three RGB channels, so let's add a component mask and get any one of them. After that, I know that I have previously said that if operations are frowned upon, but this is a very lightweight shader, so we'll look away this time and keep it a secret. Now we'll connect these nodes to follow the effect instructions that I described earlier. The desaturated image goes on input A, any channel of the mask texture that you want to use goes on input B and we'll create a couple of scalar constants with values set to 1 and 0. 1 needs to be connected to A greater than B and A equals B and 0 goes on the last input. Whoa, that's a bit too much. We can now go back to our samplers and add a texture coordinate node to increase the tiling until we get something that looks a bit better or swap the texture mask to see how it looks when we use the blue noise texture instead. 
if we take a look at it in the viewport, we will see what could be a potential issue depending on the exact nature of the effect that you want to achieve. The texture is mapped to the screen, so it stays fixed when the player moves around. That might be fine if the effect is supposed to happen in the camera or the player's eyes, or if there are lots of moving objects on the screen at a time and you have high resolution. However, if the effect is meant to be part of the world, you might want the dither pattern to move with the player, or at least rotate with the camera. While we could get a fully localized dither pattern by sampling a 3D noise texture around the camera location, I promise that this would be a beginner tutorial, so we'll take a much easier shortcut by mapping the texture to an actual sphere that will stick to the player. Start by creating a sphere in the viewport or the player's blueprint. Your setup might be different than mine, but the idea here is to attach the sphere to the player's camera view. For this example, I will do it in the viewport. I'll have to set the sphere to movable so it can be attached, then set its position to 0, 0, 0 and its uniform scale to 5. Also, set the sphere to no collision, otherwise things will get spicy when you start the game. And note that in most scenarios you would want this sphere to be a part of the player's blueprint and not a level actor, but to be completely honest, I wasn't sure how well this was gonna work when I started making the video and didn't think much about it, this was more or less a random thing to try out. The reason why we're not seeing any changes yet is because the current sphere material is not double-sided, so it's invisible from the inside, but don't worry about it for now. Instead, go to your player blueprint and add a scene capture component to it. Create also a render target texture and assign it to this component. We only need to paint the sphere, so set the primitive render mode to Use Show Only List. We'll populate it in the Begin Play event in a moment. Something that you can try out here if you want to fully replicate the look of Return of the Oberdin would be to have two or more spheres with different materials and then use the stencil mask value to select a different dithering pattern on certain objects or characters in your game. To set the show only list, create a variable to select which sphere we want to capture and make it the single entry on an array. If you wanted to use more than one dithering material, you would need to have two camera components or switch the actor and render targets once per frame. And here's the moment where I realized that adding the sphere as a level actor had come back to bite me and was possibly going to do it again in the future, but it was late when I was recording this video and decided to go with it as it was. Another property to enable on the sphere is visible in scene capture only. This will hide the sphere from the viewport but still be visible to the scene capture component in the player. And just to be sure that it doesn't render anywhere, disable Visible in Reflection Capture and Cast Shadow as well. If you're using distance fields in your project, you will need to disable those as well, but we don't have to do it for this tutorial. Now we can create a material and assign it to this sphere. I've called this one M underscore Dither Mapped, and it will be extremely simple, as we'll see next. Open this material and in the general properties set the shading model to unlit and enable two-sided. Those are the only changes that we need to make, the rest is just sampling any dither texture that you choose. I'm still going to add both patterns so we can see the difference between the textures in the final effect. And much like we did before on the basic example, you might want to add a texture coordinate node multiplied by a parameter to control the texture tiling especially if you use multiple patterns with different texture sizes. Give me a moment to finish connecting everything here so we can give this a try. Once I've set the Capture Actor property to reference the level place sphere, it seems like nothing is happening. But if we open our render target, we can see the capture in real time. Well, the texture is there, and if you squint your eyes, you can even tell that it has a spherical deformation. 
The reason why it isn't moving is because right now the sphere is also rotating with the camera, so the capture is always facing the same part of it. To fix this, we simply have to change the sphere rotation from relative to world. Let's do that and check the render target again to see if that worked. Great, this is exactly what we wanted. I'm guessing that the YouTube video compression is probably going to show just a mess of pixel noise, but in my screen it looks decent. I'm using unfiltered texture so the results look very crisp. Note that the texture won't change when the camera moves in straight lines, only when it rotates. As I mentioned earlier, you could fix this by sampling a 3D noise instead, or with other clever math. Let me show a problem that I encountered because I was using the default Unreal Sphere and you might also experience. The topology and UV mapping of this mesh are not made for this type of usage, so the texture gets very stretched at the poles. You can change this mesh for another one with more resolution and better texture mapping to fix this problem. The easiest way to do it would be to subdivide it a few times and reproject the UVs on Unreal's own mesh editor. We'll leave that fix for another tutorial though. For this example, I will simply try not to orient the camera too vertically. Back in the post-process material from earlier, I'm going to copy-paste this group of notes from my Edge Detection Shader tutorial video. Check it out if you want to know all about it. The rest for now will be sampling our render target and replacing the input on the IF node. Since this texture already has the spherical deformation, we cannot scale it here. That is why we are controlling the tiling on the geometry material instead. The only change that I made to the edge detection part is that I deleted the color input and added these two nodes, a round and a one minus. If we get the single channel desaturated image that we used at the beginning and round that value, we'll get either zero or one for each pixel we can invert that value with a 1 minus, which will give us black or white lines depending on their brightness. The rest is just connecting the output of the if node, which is the dithered image, to the first input of this lerp, to blend it with the edge lines. A saturate node will clamp the value between 0 and 1, and now we can try this out. Not too bad! On close-ups, or when the camera rotates slowly, this spherical mapping produces better results than the traditional screen map textures, in my opinion. And again, this type of high noise video is the worst for streaming compression, but believe me, with the right textures and settings, you can get very interesting looks for your game. Something else that you could try is to change the sphere scale non-uniformly to adjust how much the texture stretches around the edges of the screen. I tried different values off-camera and without making a new sphere or modifying this mesh, I couldn't scale it too much without doing horrible things to this poor texture. For the last part of this tutorial, we're going to add a bit of color to this shader. Since we only have 0 and 1 values in our mask, we can do this with a tiny bit of math, but it will be even easier to simply add two color parameters and a linear interpolate between both using this mask as the alpha. For those still curious about the math, you just have to multiply the mask by one of the colors and its inverse by the other, before adding both together. Either way, we can set some default values for these colors, output this to the emissive and see the final results. Excellent! We could spend some time changing the shader parameters or adding more effects to it, like different masks per object or changing the parameters over camera distance. But I think this will be enough for entry-level tutorial and I will end today's lesson here. If you stayed until the end, thank you for watching this video. And if you like the content and want to see more like it, consider subscribing and leaving a comment below to let me know what effect or material you want to see me break down. See you next time!